being here. Oh, thank you so much for having me. You, this is your second presidential bid. Why are you running? I'm running because I feel that the United States needs to make an economic U-turn. Um, you know, poll after poll shows that this country is moving in the wrong direction. That's the, the sense of the people, and the people are correct. And the whole the radicalism, in a way, at the core of the American ideal is that the people direct things. And yet right now, things are being directed not so much by the people as by corporate donors and corporate huge entities of corporate wealth that actually determine our path. So the people need to step in there and turn things around. Are you getting the people to support you financially? Well, I am. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm in there. That's what uh, a campaign is all about. You know, a campaign is a, is a big job interview. It's a long job interview. And you are presenting yourself uh, to the people. You're presenting your agenda. You're letting people know this is what I would do if I was given the job. And people think about it. Now, the problem we have right now, however, is that there are forces who seek to limit uh, the, the voices that are actually presented to the people. This is why it's so important that the Democratic Party allow debates so that voters in the Democratic primary can recognize there are three candidates so far, and uh, the American people should have as wide an array of options before them as possible. What have you heard from the Democratic Party about debates? Well, what I've heard from the Democratic Party about debates is what you and everybody else has heard, and that is that they don't plan to have any. They have simply decided that Joe Biden is the nominee. That's not democracy. A party that should be and has traditionally been such a champion of democracy itself should not be so wary of the democratic process in our own house. So what is your strategy? Where are you, where are you right now in the country? <clears throat> and, and how do you plan to keep stay in this race? Well, given that the party as you said, well, the, what's Joe are, Biden? The, the, you know, the parties are not even mentioned in the Constitution. They are not the ultimate authority here. The people are the ultimate authority here. And I'm staying in the race because I'm talking to the people. A lot of that uh, conversation with people these days, as you know, is online, TikTok, et cetera, uh, various uh, online uh, platforms. But also there are those early primary states, New Hampshire, Michigan, Georgia, South Carolina, Nevada. You, you go out there. That's, that's the American way. And that's what I'm participating in. You're popular on TikTok. Explain your strategy there. You know, it's interesting we use the word strategy, but I, look at Donald Trump when he won uh, in 2016. Did he have a strategy or did he not just hit a nerve? I think that that's my main strategy, is telling truth. I, I think that I'm saying a lot of things that everybody says, but few people say them in public. Few people say them when the microphone is on. And that is that we are not at the moment functioning as a government of the people by the people and for the people. You know, at, at the battlefield at Gettysburg, Lincoln said that the men who died, who were soldiers for the Union, had died on that battlefield, had given he, what he called their last full measure of devotion, so that a government of the people, by the people, and for the people would not perish from the earth. It is perishing now. We are, for all intents and purposes, a government of the corporations, by the corporations, and for the corporations. Our Congress is in many ways little more than a system of legalized bribery, where legislator after legislator in the final analysis does more to answer to the goals of their corporate donors than to the people of the United States. We have the safety, the well-being, the health of the American people at this point is almost secondary to the profit margins of insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies, big agricultural chemical companies, food companies, gun manufacturers, uh, big oil and defense contractors. The people know this. We have 39 percent of the American people who now report that they skip meals in order to pay their rent. This is in the richest country in the world. And that number goes up to 44 percent among millennials. One third of Americans are living very economically unstable lives. One in four Americans are living with medical debt. We have the highest poverty rate, including the highest child poverty rate of any country in the world. We have half of our seniors living on less than $25,000 a year. We have a third of our workers living on less than $15 an hour and not having a place to live. Things are not going well. So what would you do? Well, we have to have an economic U-turn in this country, as I said. We need to recognize that the rights that hold together a level of economic stability and the capacity of people to thrive that are granted to the citizens of every other advanced democracy should be granted to the American, such as universal health care, 
such as tuition-free college, which we had in this country until the 1960s, such as free child care, such as paid maternity and paternity leave, such as guaranteed sick pay and guaranteed livable wage. Those are the pillars. They should be seen as the main organs that provide people with the ability to thrive, not just survive an unjust economic system. That platform sounds like President Biden's platform. He's tried it. Democrats have tried it. Yeah. How would you be different? <clears throat> well, President, I, I, I will certainly uh, admit that if we had gotten Build Back Better, that would have been amazing. But we didn't get Build Back Better. And there are still things that the president could do. For instance, the president had said that we would have a raising of that minimum wage, which we haven't had in 13 years. As I said, a third of American workers live on less. Give me a break. So the president got it for, for federal workers. But then it came time to put it in a bill. And you know what stopped it? the parliamentarian. Now, truly, would the Republican Party ever allow themselves to be stopped by the parliamentarian? We allowed ourselves to be stopped by the parliamentarian because it was convenient to do so. The president has also approved the Willow Project. The president has given more, uh, has given more oil drilling permits than even Trump did. The president is a nice man. This is not about who's not a nice man. But I have serious um, uh, disagreements with the president about such fundamental things as whether or not we guarantee that this will be a habitable planet in 100 years. Marion Williamson with us this morning. Let's get to calls. Connie in Florida, independent caller. Go ahead. Yes, uh, thanks for taking my call. Uh, Marianne, I'm a longtime student of the course and I've studied uh, for several decades now. And I want to know how your political ambitions align with the teachings of the course, i.e. of <clears throat> ego. You know, I, am, I think of myself as radically American. And the foundational principles, which are included in our Declaration of Independence, are deeply spiritual and deeply humanitarian. Our first principles are, number one, all men are created equal. Number two, God gave all men inalienable rights of life and of liberty and the pursuit of happiness. In the book of Deuteronomy, it says, justice, justice, thou shalt pursue. If, in fact, as it says in the Declaration of Independence, governments, as it says there, are instituted, our government is instituted in order to secure those rights of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness, that means we must pursue justice. We do not have environmental justice. We do not have economic justice. We do not have criminal or racial justice in this country that we should have. That is love. To me, what is love? Love is you feed the hungry child. It is outrageous that we have hungry children in this country. And you know, Greta, you asked about the president. You know, the Democrats, uh, the corporate elite leadership establishment Democrats, like to brag about the fact that with a, a child tax credit, they have uh, they cut child poverty in half, which is very good. Although I would also say if you can cut it in half, you could eradicate it. However, what happened there is that it expired, that tax credit expired in six months, and no one got around to making it permanent. So that, to me, is what love is. Love is not just a word. Love is an action. That means you remove the economic shackles that so many people live under in this country. Not all chains are visible. And the chains of economic debt and economic anxiety and economic despair that the majority of Americans live under, to me, it is a loving thing to remove those shackles. And that's a humanitarian principle that should replace the economic bottom line, the very greedy and soulless economic bottom line that now governs our country. We'll go to Rob next, who's in Dutchess <coughs> County, New York. Democratic caller. Good morning, Rob. Hey, good morning. Thank you for C-SPAN. Um, you're never going to get elected talking about love. I mean, <laughs> God bless you. But, um, you know, I agree with you, most all your positions. But um, one cannot speak from weakness and one cannot, that's not what voters are going to go for. One cannot speak from uh uh, from uh, hoity-toity, uh, uh, abstract language. You need to talk plain talk, plain English. And unfortunately, in today's world, like a guy like Trump, he's a shock jock. He's an idiot, but he's a shock jock, and he gets everybody's attention. And he talks plain talk. So, you know, well, my Rob, Rob, can I ask you, what kind of plain talk do you want to hear? 
everything should be plain talk. And we got to get off of talking about su subjects in such a way where we just make ourselves weak. If it talks about a male body swimming competitively with m other males, not with females, all of these things, the immigration, we need to get strong on the border, just like on the Republicans, the way they talk strong. You got to talk strong. Okay. You got to talk. Plain. Understood. Understood. <laughs> Marion Williamson. Well, I was mentioning love because the last caller asked me about it. And um, I think the fierce mother who wants to take care of the children, take care of our shared home, which is the earth, you know, love restores reason and not the other way around. I would argue that this fake bully nonsense, uh, toxic masculine way of looking at the world that is represented by the, by the former president has gotten us to where we are. And I would suggest that you know, you say that's not the way to get, that anything else is not the way to get elected. Well, that is not the way to repair this country. So the fact that I offer something that is an alternative to such a sophomoric language, I think is a good thing, not a bad thing. This country elected Abraham Lincoln. This country has elected some intellectual giants. Uh, the political system has trained us to think like seventh graders. And this is not a time to think like seventh graders. Um, I find, you know, it's interesting, uh, Greta, if, if, you, if you have any two Americans that just talk, we are decent people, I believe this strongly, we get real. We talk about what's really going on in our lives. But when it comes to our public conversation, particularly our political conversation, we all go into these sophomoric, excuse me if that's too big a word for anybody, but I don't think it is, into these almost childish slogans. This is not a time in our history where we can afford to do that. We must get deeper. You know, Franklin Roosevelt said that the most important job of the presidency, he said, is not, uh, is not administrative, but is moral leadership. And I think people are ready for a conversation about what is true in our hearts. That is where this country is off course. We are governed by an economic system that is soulless, that puts short-term profits for huge corporate entities before the health and safety and well-being of our people and our planet. This is unsustainable. It is morally wrong. It is spiritually wrong. It is politically wrong. And we must change this. Let's go to Colorado. Everett's <clears throat> there in Grand Junction, Colorado. Republican caller. Good morning, Miriam. Um, I am a Republican, of course. Uh, but uh, that doesn't mean that I wouldn't vote for you in your campaign. But I would like to ask you a, a constitutional question. You mentioned earlier that the parties were not mentioned in the Constitution. And uh, uh, when Ben Franklin was around, he was asked a question about the republic and, the, you know, and what form of government we were going to have. And he responded by saying, uh, republic, as long as we can keep it. I would also ask, like you to maybe relook at Article 4, uh, Section 4 in the Constitution, and that says the United States shall guarantee to every state in the Union a Republican form of government. Now, to me, a Republican form of government is a representative form of government. And I do wish you uh, good luck on your campaign. <clears throat> well, thank you very, very much. Um, I agree with the things that you said. And I also point out that uh, President Eisenhower said that the American mind at its best is both liberal and conservative. You know, a free society is not one in which all of us see everything the same way all the time or have to. So the interplay, the realization that nobody has a monopoly on truth, everybody has some good uh, ideas to offer, we need to get back to that. There are high-minded conservative values. There are high-minded democratic values. We are a Republican form of government. We are also a democracy. We are, as you yourself said, a representative democracy. So that constant interplay between uh, federal power and state power, um, as uh, I think it was Hamilton who said, that the states are the laboratories of reform. That was played out, that conversation was established in the Constitution, and we're playing it out in our lives today. So thank you, sir. I appreciate it. I appreciate your open-mindedness. And, and I want to point out there, you know, this business about uh, parties not being mentioned in the Constitution. George Washington warned us about them in his farewell address. He said that they can become, uh, men can become factions who care more about their factions than about their country. And John Adams also said he thought it was the greatest threat to democracy. We need to stop filtering 
our thoughts and our behavior only through political parties. We need to become consistently devoted to those elements, to those constitutional principles and the principles of the Declaration of Independence that matter most to us, we ourselves as people. Gabrielle in Carnegie, Pennsylvania, Independent. Good morning to you. Good morning, Marianne. Thank you so much for taking my call. Thank you. <clears throat> Hey, so I had uh, I just have two quick questions, and um, I'm actually there's about 500 of us watching on uh, Left Flank Vets on Twitch, and one my first question is how do how can you force Biden to debate with you, and then secondly, if you were to get elected, all of the special interests would call all of their politicians that they own, and they would make sure no one would work with you. How could you? How do you think you can actually? move your agenda if you were to get elected. That's, and thank you so much. That's an excellent and a legitimate question. So, number one, your first question, I can't force the president to uh, to to debate me. However, Robert Kennedy Jr. and, and I are both quite vocal about uh, um, challenging the president to a debate pointing out that this is a democracy, that, as I said before, people should have as wide array of options before them as possible, particularly those of us who do wish to see the Democrat in tw uh, win in 2024. We need to be having a very serious conversation about who actually is the best candidate. What is the personality? What is the energy level? And what is the agenda that would, in fact, be the strongest opponent for 2024? It shouldn't be, you know, this business of the DNC just dictating the process. It reminds me of like a hundred years ago when a bunch of men would sit around a, a table smoking cigars deciding who the nominee should be. That's not the way this should work. The primary voter should decide. And it's not just I can't force it, but I'll tell you, you and everyone listening and everyone who cares about this basic principle of democracy can be raising, raising their voices about this. It is already polls show the majority of Democrats want to hear what the other options are. The second question you asked is, as I said, quite legitimate. No matter who the president is, that president is hoping that they have a party that will work with him or her. But let's not forget, no matter what, even if you don't have a House that's willing to work with you, even if you don't have a Senate that's willing to work with you, the president has tremendous power. The president of the United States does not have a magic wand, nor do we want that in this country. But the president can uh, produce executive orders. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> the CBO says that we could responsibly, and that's a CBO, which is a pretty responsible voice, Congressional Budget Office, um, says that we could cut a trillion dollars over the next decade from the military, uh, from our military budget, and, and be fine. The president could unilaterally cl begin to close bases. We have about 800 military installations and bases in about 80 countries. There is so much the president could do by executive orders. The president can demand that there be an auditing of the Pentagon. The president can deschedule marijuana from Schedule One drug. Many would argue that if the president had just come in and canceled the entire college loan debt, that the, um, the opposition to his even shaving off $10,000 uh, would not have uh, been as easy to stage. Let's not kid ourselves. The president still has a lot of power. And the president has the bully pulpit. I would be saying the truth to people. This is a time when we need some radical truth telling. We have some lies in this country, some serious lies that are being fostered. And the answer to that, the way to defeat that and to override it is to tell some serious truths. But we're going to have to be honest with ourselves. The pres the, the, this country has to reckon with some serious mistakes we've made in the past. We need to take a good look in the mirror. Where are we not living the principles that we say we are? And that is what is going to get us to the other side of this. I, as president, because I have had 40 years helping people and organizations endure chaos and transform chaos, that's what I will do as president. Now, I also want to say one last thing to that. I believe that if people see... The idea of my being president as, you know what, this is not a bad idea. I want to go for that. Then they also, we have to begin an entirely new era of citizenship in this country. Many of us have thought, oh, you know, I'll vote every two years. I'll show up for the congressional elections. I'll show up for the, uh, for the presidential. But that's not enough because corporate lobbyists sometimes without our best intentions at heart are in the offices of our legislators every day. Not only that, but some of the things we need to most worry about in this country are not just forces that are active in Washington. They are active throughout the states, in every single state capital. 
<clears throat> so we need a new era of citizenship. We need people who begin to see our civic activism as simply part of a meaningful and well-lived life. So that means that if people support my campaign, you need to also get involved in the congressional elections in your district, senatorial elections if they're happening th that year, this coming election in your states, and you have to get involved on the level of primary so that I am delivered the kinds of legislators who would play ball with me, and then we'll really get a lot done and turn on this country around. On support for your campaign <clears throat> and debates, yes. in 2020, the criteria to get on the debate stage where there were two of them. Mm -hmm. One, breaking 1% 1 in three polls from pollsters approved by the DNC, or tallying 65,000 unique campaign <clears throat> donors with at least 200 donors in 20 different states. Would you meet those two criteria right now? Oh, in terms of the amount of, vote, of donors, you know, I don't know. I'd have to make a call to my campaign manager and ask that. I actually don't know. I certainly would in terms of polls. with was a national poll that already had me at 10%. But now, of course, if they're not, you know, who knows what they would say you have to do to get into debates today. It's almost a no question at the moment because they're saying there won't be any. But hopefully the voices of the people will be loud enough. There will be enough public pressure and the DNC will give in on that. Ramona, Lithonia, <coughs> Georgia, Democratic caller. Um, good morning, ladies. Yes, I am an American Indian, and I would like to know... Um, I'm on Social Security, SSDI, which means I work for my money. Um, I hope that the Republicans do not uh, approve the death ceiling, uh, because if I lose my check because of that, I'll be so glad because then we will vote, vote them out. So what do you feel about the Social Security? Social Security must not be touched. If anything, we need to remove the cap entirely. Um, we, we, we need to not touch Social Security. But I, I'm not, did you understand, Greta, how the debt ceiling question, she's afraid that if we take it back that she will get less in Social Security? She's afraid that under the <clears throat> House Republican proposal, if you tie raising the debt ceiling to federal cuts, I think federal spending cuts, taking it back <clears throat> to last year's level, I think she's concerned about Social Security disability, the program. The, the Democrats need to hold strong there. The president had said in the last, uh, last uh, State of the Union, nobody's going to touch your Social Security. Um, and certainly if I'm president, nobody's going to touch your Social Security. In fact, as I said, we need to raise the cap so that everybody's paying into it. AJ, you're next. Columbus, Kansas, Independent. Hi, Marianne. I'm uh, watching uh, with 500 people on uh, twitch.tv slash let's blank vets and i am curious about your rural plan um do you support like right to repair or um <clears throat> uh uh ending amas i'm curious about your opinion on that rural thank you saying rural plans aj yeah, rural Rural plants. Yeah. Rural. R-U-R-A-L. Yes. Okay. <laughs> rural America has been in many ways neglected by both parties over the last few decades. I was in a, a small town in South Carolina um, during this last campaign, and the mayor said something that impacted me and stayed with me. He said, you know, there are many people in this country, particularly young couples with children, they cannot afford to have the lives that they want on the coast. I have, he said, here in my town, I have everything that they could possibly want in order to start over, in order to raise a family. He said, but what has happened, I don't have the roads that I need in order to attract them. I don't have the sewage system I need in order to attract them. I don't have the grid. I don't have the schools. He said, before the 1980s, we had small banks, and the small banks catered to the rural farmers. And the small banks would say, a farmer would go into the bank and say, you know, I didn't do too well this year. So the, the local bank would say, I understand you. You're wasn't great. Come back. We'll carry, we'll carry this forward and you'll, you'll pay us next year. What started to happen in the 1980s was this huge monopolization and conglomeratization of everything was that many of these smaller banks were replaced by these huge banks. And the huge banks were acting in service to the huge agricultural companies. So this squeezed out. And before that, when there were these small banks and there was attention and focus on the small farmer, the, the U.S. government would not only give loans, but the loans that were given to the municipalities, to the rural municipalities, came along with grants. All that was gotten rid of in order to serve big banks and big ag. That would change when I'm president. We'll go next from, to Rhonda, Freehold, <clears throat> New Jersey, Democratic caller. You are speaking to Marianne Williamson. Go ahead. Oh, good morning, Miss Williamson. It 
it is an honor to speak with you. I absolutely love you. I watch you on YouTube. And I would love to see a woman run for the highest office in the land because women have compassion and we live on budgets. What's upsetting to me the most about the Republican Party here is I wouldn't vote for a Republican and for a dog catcher. That's how much they have corrupted themselves with the Donald Trump administration. They're all crooks, in my opinion. You know, and I am terrified of where our country is headed now that they have Ron DeSantis there, who's absolutely trying to erase black history from our country. This man is crazy. He's Donald Trump on steroids. He's a copycat with no personality <clears throat> at all. But what I would like to say that, that I love about women is that we have been reversed 50 years in this democracy with the Republican rule. And now that they have the Congress, there's no immigration reform that they're putting forward. They're still blaming Joe Biden for everything they have done to this country. Tucker Carlson's tapes came out last night on um, Albie Mel uh, Melbourne's show. You know, to think that he thinks this way about me, black people, that it's okay to kill a black boy and crush his face in? This is the Republican Party. They are fascists, and we got to stop them. we got to stop oh. these people. All right, Rhonda. Marianne <clears throat> Williamson. Um, I think that there are neo-fascist elements there. I don't think that's the entirety of the Republican Party. Um, so I think we, we do need to all move back a little bit and have some sort of mercy and compassion and recognition that I do believe the majority of, of people in this country are decent and dignified and open. But, um, you know, Martin Luther King said you have very little morally persuasive power with people who can feel your underlying contempt. So let's move back a little bit. I agree with you that the policies of Ron DeSantis are dangerous. They're dangerous for our democracy. The six-week ban um, on abortion, many women don't even know that they are pregnant at six weeks. Uh, telling people that if you have an undocumented worker in your car or in your home, you could be tried as a felon. My God, America, does the average American not realize how many people are forced to remain in an undocumented state who themselves actually have lived here for years, paid taxes, and been very contributive as citizens? Uh, the pre uh, Ron DeSantis trying to tell uh, colleges what courses they can teach. And as you said, trying to suppress a lot of black history and so forth. I am deeply concerned about those things. That's why I think I should be the Democratic nominee, because the only way, you know, Franklin Roosevelt said this, we would not have to worry about a fascist or a communist takeover in this country, he said, as long as democracy delivered on its promises. The deeper problem is not just the disease of neo-fascism and authoritarianism. The problem is also the weakening of our societal immune system. So we're being attacked on the outside by this trickle-down economic neoliberal economics, but it, by, by authoritarianism, I mean, but we're eroding from the inside by this economic principle of trickle-down that has weakened people's lives. So the way to the best way to defeat the Republicans in 2024 is with the economic U-turn that I have mentioned by offering to the American people universal health care, free college, cancellation of the college loan debt. And when I say free college, also free tech schools, um, uh, family paid leave, pay, paid family leave, guaranteed sick pay, free child care and a guaranteed livable wage. This is the way to defeat the fascists, not by incremental changes. You know, so many of the incremental changes that are being offered by the Democratic establishment at the moment, we're trying to tell people that the economy is doing well. 20% of the American people are thriving in today's economy. And that 20%, it's like we live on an island that is surrounded by a vast sea of economic despair. We can't win in 2024 by 
by saying, oh, but we're giving you a little bit here and a little bit there, and we did that, and even though we stopped that at six months, that's not going to win. We are going to win by saying, you should, we want to do more than ameliorate your stress. We want fundamental economic reform. We want to do more than help you survive an unjust economic system. We want to end the system of un injustice, and that is why I'm the candidate who is the best one to defeat the the, uh, whether it's DeSantis or Trump, the people that you're most concerned about in 2024. How will you measure success as you <clears throat> go along? What are your milestones that you need to reach to stay in the race? Well, I am aware that what I'm saying is what's aligned with poll after poll shows that the American people agree with me. The American people in poll after poll, you know, they're a little bit left of center. The American people want universal health care, free college and tech school and so forth. Remember, the positions that I'm speaking to are moderate positions in every other advanced democracy. So the people are not the problem. The issue for me is simply getting to the people. Now, there is, and I appreciate your having me on, the, the, there is in this country what I call a political, uh, in, uh, political media industrial complex. So there's a lot of mainstream media uh, that conspires with the political elite in this country to make it very difficult for people to hear me, to be on some of the programs which you think I would be on, given that I'm a declared candidate for president of the United States. The young people aren't having that, though. The young people are, they're online. And I hope those of you, thank you to those of you who are watching me on Twitch and, and all these other alternative platforms, not just cable television. Thank you for doing so. Help me spread the word. Go to Marianne2024.com. Donate if you can, even $3. And uh, we have to get this message out there ourselves because the message, it actually resonates with the declared attitudes of the majority of people are exactly the messages that are most suppressed in this country. We need to wake up to this. We need to realize we've been basically played by a political elite. And if we're going to change things, the status quo will not disrupt itself. We have to get in there. So, of course... They say that anybody who has any other ideas is a little crazy, a little kooky. Of course they would say that. We need to see through that and um, step in there. You know, if you look at, at uh, abolition, if you look at women's suffrage, if you look at the labor, the original labor movement, if you look at the civil rights movement, these things came from the people. They came from the people, and then the parties picked them up. So it's time for us to do what other generations have done before us. That's rise up and push back at undemocratic forces which would limit our freedom in the United States of America. What kind of reaction are you seeing on TikTok? Oh, well, you know, it's great because the kids get it. I always say, you know, I go to colleges and universities and I point out these people were not even born in the 20th century. Or if they were, they hung out there as babies for a few years. They're not 20th century people, and they do not see why they should have to live their lives at the effect of bad economic policies left over from the 20th century. They look at Europe. They know that, that people in other advanced democracies, other advanced industrial nations, even there are democracies, they can go to college, they can go to tech schools. Um, they, they don't have any institutional memory of a time when either major political party was really, really had their back. And they are interested in hearing from someone who would. And if I'm president, they will. And they'll know it. And they'll feel it. It'll be visceral. It'll be there every day. Lake Jackson, Texas. <clears throat> Robert is there, an independent. You are next. Go ahead. <clears throat> Good morning uh, to C-SPAN and to Ms. Williamson. And I uh, wanted to know um, if you... Uh, 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 you mentioned uh, reading George Washington's 1796 farewell address, and I think you got the basic message. Your stock just went up a couple of points in my book. But what I want to know is um, that I believe that there's a growing anti-partisan movement in the United States among people that have gay <clears throat> sick and fed up of both parties to uh, not giving us a choice. What I want to know is uh, you get in office, would you work to eradicate political parties in, <clears throat> in the United States? Um um yeah um because uh we have we have well, I I've been on my opinion is what we have essentially is a two party tyranny it's called a corporate duopoly. So this is the deal. I don't think it's appropriate. I don't think it's within the power or the appropriate use of power of the president to eradicate political parties. Uh the people will make the decision of what happens with the political parties. If you look at the history of the United States, third party voices have been very important. Abolition came from abolitionist party. Women's suffrage came from women's, uh, from the women's party. Obviously the civil rights movement came from the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference and so forth. 
And also, uh, even Social Security, by the way, came from the Socialist Party. So what has happened in the last few years, last few decades, is that the Democrats and the Republicans have uh, formed a kind of unholy alliance that makes it very, very difficult for third-party voices to, to, to share their ideas, which often are very good ideas and need to be in the mix. The American people are registering their dissatisfaction with this. There's no doubt about that. But I don't think the American people are necessarily ready to actually vote that dissatisfaction because people are afraid of the spoiler candidacy. They're afraid that if I vote third party, I might actually help the person I least want to get into office. This is going to change over the next few years, but it's going to be the people that make these changes. Um, this is this will not and should not actually come from the president. Following up on that, here's a text. Curious why uh, Mrs. Williamson switched from independent to Democratic Party, though. I ran as an independent when I ran for Congress in 2014 um, because I wanted to talk about ideas that I felt were not particularly welcome within the elite establishment of the Democratic Party at that time. That change was for one year. I've been a, a lifelong Democrat, and anybody can look on my uh, you know, it's public information, the, the candidates that I've given money to. It's out there. I saw somebody talking about that on the, um, uh, uh, on the Internet the other day. I'm a Roosevelt Democrat. I was raised a Democrat. I've been a Democrat all my life. Um, I believe in the, the pillars of the Democratic Party that were personified by Franklin Roosevelt, and that is the unabashed advocacy for the American worker. That, is, that should be the spine. The spine should be taking care of the worker. Right now, we've had a $50 trillion transfer of wealth into the hands of 1% of Americans over the last 48 years. And what this has done is to create a situation where policy after policy, those who already have wealth in this country, have an easier time building even more, while everybody else has a harder time even making it at all. Now, the person of, of consciousness and conscience doesn't want to feel that they create wealth at the expense of other people having a chance to. So I believe in the traditional values of the Democratic Party, and I've stood by those. Who or what shaped your philosophy? My father, more than anyone. In fact, my father, speaking of Franklin Roosevelt, my father died in 1994. Any time that there was an election, if you said to my father, who would you vote for, Daddy? He'd say, Roosevelt. So, uh, you know, I grew up in a home where... Franklin Roosevelt was a great hero. And, and it's interesting because as I have gotten older, I have rediscovered Franklin Roosevelt for myself. You know, last year I read a book that's been out for a while um, by Doris Kearns Goodwin called No Ordinary Time about Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt during the Depression years and World War II. And it um, did so much for me and so expanded my thinking. You know, it's interesting if you look at Lincoln, if you look at, at uh, Roosevelt, both of them had plans for what they were going to do when the war was over. And that's when both of them died, Lincoln right after and, and Roosevelt right before. And Roosevelt was planning a second economic bill of rights. I'm going to be making a speech here in Washington uh, at the National Press Club on, uh, on the 18th of this month about a 21st century economic bill of rights. So that's pure Roosevelt. We need to take up where some of these people left off. Who was your father? Who was he? Mm -hmm. He was an immigration lawyer, a well-known immigration lawyer. My brother is an immigration lawyer. Uh, my father took us to Vietnam in 1965 because he said he wanted us to see. He said, uh, I came home from the seventh grade, uh, and my, my teacher, my social studies teacher, had said that if we didn't fight on the shores of Hawaii, this was during the Vietnam War, and my teacher had told us that if we didn't uh, fight on the shores of Hawaii, that, uh, that we would be fighting on, no, if we didn't fight in Vietnam, that we would be fighting one day on the shores of Hawaii. They called that the, the domino theory. And my father stood up, he said to my mother, get the visas, we're going to Vietnam. The military industrial complex is not going to eat my children's brains. <laughs> my mother said, oh, Sam, and we went. And my father wanted to make sure that we had a view of this country that was not filtered through official propaganda that does not serve us. Kathleen, in Dayton, Ohio, Democratic <clears throat> caller. Oh, Marianne. Well, first I want to say C-SPAN and Washington Journal are national treasures. And, I and agree then Marianne, with that. So, 
Yeah, so much of what you say I have such deep respect for and on poverty, on child care, on pay scales, on corporate greed, on <clears throat> on Eleanor and Franklin Roosevelt. My parents the same thing. Roosevelt was the hero and my mother even who just died a couple years ago at 93 would sit up when Senator Sanders or Senator Warren would be on the news and they'd say that's that those guys are like the Roosevelts and and that's the way all Democrats used to be. But anyway, so it's, I have such deep respect for you. On the other hand, I was at the memorial for Alicia Titus in Urbana, Ohio, with Bev, you know, Bev and John Titus. And and I, I during the question and answer period, I got up and asked you about the lack of accountability in regard to uh, the Bush administration in regard to Iraq. And you diverted, you diverted my question about accountability to Bush's nice paintings. So I, 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 I do, it brought up some questions for me in regard to justice and, and accountability with you. And I want to ask you in regard to foreign policy, you know, there we were, we invaded Iraq on many of us new world false pretenses prior to the invasion, Iraq, Syria, Libya, which we know Hillary Clinton, you know, supported as Secretary of State and as a senator. So how would you deal with foreign policy and the fact that we leave in our wake hundreds of thousands of people dead, injured, and turned into refugees? So how would you deal with foreign policy? We have to deal with the American war machine. It's in this town, it's called the blob. I referred to it a few minutes ago uh, as originally articulated by uh, by President Eisenhower. Let's not forget, not only was he a Republican president, he had been the Supreme Allied Commander during World War II. He, when he left the presidency, warned us about what he called the military-industrial complex. It is alive and well. We have an $858 billion defense budget, even though, as you said, so we've left Iraq, we've left Afghanistan, and yet our defense budget has gotten larger. I think there are people on both the left and the right in this country who realize that our foreign policy in too many cases is dominated not by legitimate security concerns, as would be determined by our own military commanders so much as they are determined by the short-term profit maximization goals of defense contractors such as Northrop Grumman, Boeing, Raytheon, and so forth. We should all be aware that our Secretary of Defense is a former board member at Raytheon. So the American people, I believe in this as in so many areas, we're about to hit an inflection point. People realize the criminality of the war in Iraq. And people realize that we were lied into that war. People realize, or I hope they realize, that while I actually support our having gone into Afghanistan, the last 20 years were a spectacular failure. And all that those wars ended up doing was to kill hundreds of thousands of people and also to just fill the coffers of that military-industrial complex. How would I deal with it? I would name it the way I just did. I would uh, lead a serious effort, which I believe that there are people in both parties who are willing to have a serious conversation now about cutting the military budget. And I would also establish a U.S. Department of Peace. Even Donald Rumsfeld said we need to wage peace. You can't just fight a disease. You have to cultivate health. You can't just prepare for war. You have to prepare for a world in which there will ultimately be no more war. Uh, John Kennedy said if we don't get rid of war, war will get rid of us. Marion Williamson, thank you for joining us this morning on The Washington Journal, for talking to our viewers. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you all for having me. We're going to take you up to Capitol Hill. Joining in progress this morning, Senate Budget Committee is looking at the House GOP proposal to raise the debt ceiling along with federal spending cuts. Live coverage here on C-SPAN. Button choice. Do not believe it. They are causing one. Many of them.